जय हिंद वीरों की शहादत को याद रखना धर्म ही नहीं हमारा कर्तव्य है इन टूडे सेगमेंट ऑफ मिलिट्री लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल लेट अस डिस्कस यूनिक वेज ऑफ रिमेम्बरेंसेस एंड मेमोरियलाइजेशन ऑफ वॉर एंड द फॉलन जय हिंद afternoon ladies and gentlemen it's privilege to welcome you all in this fourth session of lucknow military literature and cultural festival title way to remember some unique and extraordinary efforts in the fields of remembrances and memorialization since evolution fightings individually and collectively have been essential for survival defending the honor expanding territories and so on and concurrently equally important has been the remembrances and immortalization annatha ko hai jo jara so bara nahi tulsi since ramayan days to medieval period and in 20th century remembrances and commemorations have been part of individual and societal life in their different shades today mlcf is pleased to have the galaxy of such panelists who through their individual efforts have continued to keep the society's collective consciousness alive the common thread weaving them all together is swantah sukhai self satisfaction but not without the subtle message of remembering our fallen heroes and our responsibility towards them we have mrs preeti gill from maja house amritsar her exclusive efforts are now in good shape more about it little later another panelist is mr sonam kapadia from dubai who runs lieutenant navang kapadia web memorial our third panelist Ms Cheryl M Soji from Perth Australia who lost her father Captain John Albert Dalby in 1962 in Sela sector our fourth panelist is wing commander M A Afraz from Bangalore of Honor Point the biggest virtual memorial in the world moderating the discussion is major general hemant kumar singh a cavalry officer who is the main architect of conceptualizing and shaping up the military literature festival since 2015 including this the lucknow i may say that he is the most suited to conduct this session because of his some pioneering work in the form of extensive research on untouched subject of remembrances memorialization and war memorials in india under the aegis of usi he is a research fellow holding maharana pratap chair we hope to see his thesis soon in the book form interestingly his concept and design of the national war memorial was the runner up entry in the global design competition in which 426 teams participated without taking further time i now hand over to major general hemant to conduct the proceedings further general hemant sir thank you brigadier basan 
रिमेम्बरेंस मेमोरलाइजेशन एंड कमेमोरेशन यादगार यादगार के तरीके और यादगार के त्योहार दीज आर एन इन पार्ट ऑफ आर कल्चर द ग्रेट माइथोलॉजिकल वॉर्स ऑफ रामायण एंड महाभारत वॉट इम्पोर्टलाइज थ्रू सम ग्रेट लिटरेरी वर्क they that time they focused on supreme warriors in the early medieval age when cholas invaded the kingdom of kannauj as tried the great ganges they erected temples down south with the images of ganga they had carried the holy waters all the way down in the modern india one of the first memorials to have names of the soldiers and grave was the now famous bhima kore gaon memorial near pune in the picturesque area of the river by the same name sarkar and governments have created some great memorials all over the world they also organize remembrance festival we also got a national war memorial in 29 2019 after 72 years the advent of democracy has brought in the saliency and paramountcy of the citizen now we have some very meaningful examples of remembrance and memorialization wherein our fallen are given an identity and there is a creative creativity around them there is an interaction there is an inclusivity quest for individual remembrance is huge as we can see with a number of memorials which are coming up in the rural areas when i was doing my research and during the field visit i met many of the next of kin their first desire was to have a memorial of their own today we learn about four such stupendous efforts from our esteemed panelist but before that i'll play a two minute video from dr mrs mohini giri who is the chairperson of war widows association who has done some pioneering work in the field of welfare as well as creating this war widows association which is itself is in a memorial can i have the video please anurag pollution and hawan uh in great humility i'll say that my father in law was the president of india at that time and my mother in law was very 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 distressed by the so many many soldiers who were just being wounded or being killed she asked me whether i could go and see these soldiers in the hospitals and believe me i visited about 20 to 30 hospitals in border areas everywhere and i found that each of those soldiers each of my veer uh, shaheed only said to me this is the please take care of the, those whom i leave behind and don't worry about me just please go and take care of them and with those words ringing in my ears i went back and told my mother in law shoka hotel uh, a victory celebration kind of a thing when i met a lady who was a 1900 chinese aggression widow 1962 widow and she said this is the if you are really we have already formed a small kind of a group and if you can be take us so i immediately called the meeting and the war widows staff was established association was established in 1971 it was registered uh, since then there has been no going back the aims and objectives of the association have been to take care of each and every widow in the country to see that there are no tears to see all the facilities are given to them i'm very happy to say that due to the efforts made by the war widows association and of course by the good officers of, of the prime minister at that time educational concessions were given uh, gas agencies were given uh, plots were given to build houses and in every respect the government came forward to help the widow as much as possible and after that of course still there was a psychological need 
and for that need we saw to it that all the widows were together and that they could be each day be monitored it was a civil organization formed by civilians in that time except for the treasurer being a war widow mrs sabitri khanna from the 1965 war widow was the treasurer and slowly and steadily we decided that there should be a memorial for them and a shaheed bhavan was built and this is how uh, the war widows association started today my mind goes back to 1970 thank you uh, i think war widows association has done a great job now we will travel all the way to amritsar where preeti gill runs a beautiful cultural place a memorial the baja house preeti gill is an independent literary agent who has more than 20 years of experience in publishing industry as a commissioning editor and rights editor She has traveled extensively in northeast of India and written on issues of conflict and women. She is the editor of Peripheral Center, Voices from India's Northeast, as well as bearing witness a report on the impact of conflict on women in Nagaland and Assam. Her writings have appeared in numerous journals and anthologies, including 1984 in Memory and Imagination. Her documentary, Ramu Buai. Mizoram's troubled years, co-produced with Sanjoy Hazarika, was released in September 2016. She has edited *She Stoops to Kill*, an anthology of murder stories by women, as well as *Insider, Outsider, Belonging and Unbelonging of India in the Northeast*, both published in 2019. She has built up an eclectic list of women writers from the Northeast, when, where she worked as the commissioning editor of *Zuban*. a feminist publisher based in delhi as an independent literary agent she represents many of her best most respected award winning writers from the region she spends her time between delhi and amritsar where she has set up literary and cultural hub the first of its kind called maja house which regularly holds literary and cultural events A new forthcoming publication is an edited volume of non-fiction essays on Punjab. So, coming to Preeti Gill, can you hear me, Preeti? Yes, thank you. Okay, Preeti, my first uh, question to you about your amazing creation is: you run one of the most uh, respected and lovable cultural places. Maja House is also a memorial of. Uh, Lieutenant uh, S. S. Billu Gill of Nine Deck and Horse, who fell at a tender age of 23, fighting the enemy in the Battle of Cham on 4th and 5th December 1971. The story of your brother-in-law and your journey till you created Maja House. Preeti. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And first of all, let me thank you, General Hemant Singh, for inviting me here today to speak at this uh, very special session, a way to remember, uh, which is on memorials and memorializing. Um, I would also like to thank the Lucknow Military Lit Fest. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here to tell you a little bit about uh, Billu. Billu uh, was my brother-in-law, whom I never met. but whose name and face has been imprinted on my mind ever since i entered the gill family home in amritsar way back in 1980 uh, swaranjit singh gill or billu as he was called by friends and family was handsome dashing the much feted darling of his extended family he grew up in a vibrant and cosmopolitan social environment his early schooling was in ashoka hall in calcutta and later at hansraj murarji public school in bombay a keen sportsman good in extracurricular activities he was also very good at academics and right from the beginning he had a flair for everything military while at school he was selected to lead an ncc section uh, at the 1964 republic day parade taking the nda route to join the army was his dream and his passion and so it came as no surprise to the family that he was selected to the 35th uh, course nda and he was commissioned in december 1969 he won several awards and appointments while he was uh, undergoing training 
he wanted to join the Central India Horse because of parental claim. But then he was persuaded to join the Deccan Horse by an officer instructor at the IMA who was very fond of him. Bilu was an officer and a gentleman, good looking, social, outgoing. He was a soldier to the core proud of his uniform and popular with his course mates and friends who would often go out of the way to spend time in his home in Bombay. When he got his commission into the Deccan horse, it was a very proud moment for the family. And his father decided to gift him a red bullet motorcycle. This became his prized possession. His father and my father-in-law, Sardar G.S. Gill, was commissioned as a pilot officer in the Royal Indian Air Force in 1942, and he was transferred to the Royal Indian Navy. After demobilization in early 1947, he joined the civil aviation, and he was awarded the Shaurya Chakra in the 19, after the 1971 war for his dedication in the discharge of his uh, <laughs> because he kept uh, Amritsar airport functioning uh, despite the heavy bombing. Uh, Bilu's grandfather was also a uh, you know, sort of uh, very much uh, uh, in the army. He was Dakidar Meher Singh of Central India Horse, and he was also a war hero of uh, the First World War. So this was the mantle of bravery that he had inherited uh, from his father and his grandfather. And he died fighting for his country in 1971 uh, when he was deployed in the Cham sector, as you mentioned. Bilu lost his life which was in many ways yet to begin very early because he was barely 22 years old when he died. On the 3rd of December, 1971, Billu took casual leave and he was on his way uh, from his regiment location at PDC Cham to Jammu airport to meet his father who was going to come there for an inspection. And it was on that very day that war broke out and Billu immediately rode back about 40 miles in total blackout to get back to his regiment. That very, that very night, he was deployed uh, with his tanks across the river Tabi to fight an advancing Pakistani army. And on the 6th of December, he was killed in a fierce tank battle. On the 10th of December, 1971, his father got this news via telegram from the then army chief. The war continued and Bilu's father took only a few hours off to go and inform his family uh, uh, who were all uh, there at his village nearby. Um, my husband, Kulminder, uh, who was younger to him by about six years, uh, looked up to him as his hero. On the 15th of January, 1972, an officer of the regiment brought home his personal belongings, and that was the only closure that the family had and the family ever got. Bilu's devastated parents built uh, their home, Billu's house, in a quiet neighborhood in Amritsar. And it was on land that was uh, given to them by the government on, uh, at the time. They never forgot their brave son. They kept alive his memory, traveling to his regiment year after year, telling and retelling stories about him to their grandchildren. This was their way of memorializing. When I married Kulminder and uh, stepped into the house, I felt the grief and sorrow, and I saw the photographs, I saw the memorabilia that was scattered everywhere in the house. I heard stories about Bilu and about incidents, and all of it endeared him to me. And also, despite his absence, it seemed that he was always there. He was very much a part of our present. And even after our children came, they knew their Tayaji, and his handsome portrait that adorned the wall was as familiar to them as their own father or their grandparents. Never did one feel that he was not really there as a physical person because in his absence was his presence. Today, uh, many, many years later, Billu's house has metamorphosed into Maja House. We set up the SS Gil Maja House Trust in 2018 in his memory. Uh, there is renewed growth and flowering. And with my own background, which you just talked about, uh, as an editor and a consultant, and now as literary agent, I decided to turn the house into a cultural and literary hub, a space where we could build new narratives of hope, where we could keep alive 
uh, the stories that had been handed down to us by generations of our forefathers and our foremothers from both sides of the family. Stories of partition, of rebirth and regeneration, of hope, of building peace and understanding so that all these lives that are lost in battles and wars do not go in vain. We chose the name Maja House with great deliberation to pinpoint its exact location to recover and rediscover the indomitable spirit of Punjab, ever resilient of a culture and a literature that may have been lost or forgotten, but which is rich and varied and which will help us to build these bridges between communities, especially on both sides of the border, the border that is so close to us as we live in Amritsar. The syncretic culture that sustained this land is what we try to revive. And we do this through discussion and dialogue, performance and poetry across the divide. And we look forward to creating a more harmonious and peaceful environment. We've built up a community of literature lovers, of people who are happy to come together to talk and to listen, to debate, sing, see films, see performances, listen to some of the most brilliant minds of our times. Uh, the Maja House family comprises all those who want to be intellectually challenged and who enjoy a good adda. There are academics and theater goers, performers, poets, writers, bankers, doctors, everybody's come together. And we have a wonderful team that looks after all the programs that we put together as well. These are the backbone, backbone of uh, Maja House. Uh, this house has been a witness to so many stories of loss and of longing, both of a beloved son and of a beloved homeland. But it's also a place that we've nourished and it in turn nourishes us and it gives us extreme happiness. Um, Thank you. That's what I wanted to tell you about Billu and about a little bit about Maja House. I'd like you to play that little video if possible. Thank you, Preeti. It just so happened. Okay. Ah. Oh, you can bring tears to your eyes. Uh, while uh, Preeti, I was introducing Preeti, our host was ejected out because there was so much of rush coming in. And one of us left and he has come in, so that's how the video got delayed. Uh, I've been to Maja house, I've attended so many programs. Preeti, very quickly, we just saw this uh, beautiful video about Maja house and we heard you talk, it's ventures. Tell me, how does the family friend feel about this creative way of memorializing and remembering and contributing with the society, peace, harmony? How do you feel? Just shortly, very quickly. Thank you. Um, building Maja House has been a really positive thing uh, for my family because it's a way to reconnect with the land and with its people. Uh, my father, uh, was also extremely proud of the space that I had created. And uh, I think for all of us, uh, it is a space that we feel um, sort of rejuvena rejuvenates us. It also connects us back to the land. And for me personally, it's also the first time that I'm actually living in Punjab, living in Amritsar. So 
becoming part of its rich life and its rich culture. So I'm really very, very happy about that. Um, you know, we re renovated a bit. So we now have a library, we have a cafe. Um, and every Saturday we hold sessions, uh, which we've continued to do after COVID uh, when we've gone online from April of 2020. So it's, it's really been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Uh, my last question, just one liner. How much of closure, uh, say, just share something about that. A closure, like I said in the beginning, uh, I think that uh, the, the sadness and the grief that always seemed to envelop that house in earlier days, I feel that that to some extent has been lifted. And just like you heard in this song, because the song was written by a young man who visited us on that very first festival that we did there in uh, March 2018. The house which belonged to us as a private space is now a public space. We've opened our doors and we expect people, we expect people to come in. We like the fact that the house is now populated. The house is ringing with laughter and with talk. That is the best closure that we could have had to the tragedy that the family underwent. Thank you, PC. It has been the most fascinating thing. Uh, I will now move on to the area of web and go to Dubai to welcome uh, Sonam Kapadia, who is the elder brother of Lieutenant Nawan Kapadia. He has been maintaining the web memorial nawang.com for over 20 years in the memory of his brother. This memorial is the largest web memorial for a soldier anywhere in the world. It is the focal point of all activities which are done in the memory of Tawang. It has over 250 pages, 500 photographs, poignant stories, as well as poetry of substance. It is used by more than 100,000 visitors annually who pay homage to our courageous soldiers. The memorial <coughs> is continuously updated. Lieutenant Nawang Kapadia was commissioned into the 4th Battalion of the 3rd Burka Rifle. He made the supreme sacrifice for the country just, just 70 days after his commissioning. His family includes his parents, Harish and Geeta Kapadia. Harish is a renowned mountaineer and expert on the Himalayas. We read his writings being the people from uniform. Geeta is a painter and a keen mountaineer herself. Sonam is a financer by profession. He completed his MBA from Mumbai University and engineering from Pune. He lives in Dubai with his wife, Charu Dua. Sonam, I will uh, ask you my first question. You run one of the most respected and visited uh, websites in the memory of your brother who fell gallantly in the service of nation on 11 November 2000. It is perhaps the most touching web memorial. <clears throat> Share us your journey oh, and that of the Nawang family till now. Is Nawang still alive in a way? Sonam. Sonam, are you there? Yes, I'm there. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, th thank you so much uh, uh, for the kind introduction and uh, thank you to uh, the Military Literature Festival Lucknow for uh, the generous invitation. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in remembrance, keeping memories alive because, you know, a, a, person, uh, a person remains alive and vibrant as long as the last person who remembers him uh, is alive. So remembrance is... You know, it's a very important part of uh, part of what I've been doing for the past uh, twenty years. Now, especially in uh, you know in the military context or in context of soldiers and war and violence, I think it becomes even more even more important. We we recently saw uh, you know the Afghan army, which was a much larger, stronger, better equipped force, uh, melting away in front of a very disorganized, uh, poorly equipped uh, force and. A lot of experts have put that onto, onto the will to fight. And the will to fight, it's a difficult thing to define. It's an even more difficult thing to, 
uh, to cultivate. It's cultivated by discipline, cultivated by training. But one of the most important ways in which it is cultivated is by, is by repeating stories, by showing examples of bravery, by showing examples of valor, by showing others who were, who were facing a momentous decision and the decision they made, how did they come about it. All these things eventually come into the psyche both of the soldiers uh, who continue to serve and, uh, and of the civilian population. And it shows them what is the role of a soldier, how difficult, dangerous, and violent their lives uh, uh, can be. So by repeating remembrance, by repeating stories, by repeating uh, what Navang, uh, what inspired Navang uh, to join the army, what did he do once uh, he had joined the army, and what potentially led him into a rescue of a soldier uh, where he sacrificed his life. Uh, I think that that tremendously helps um, uh, in keeping his memory alive, keep, keeping al alive not only with us and within the family, but uh, also to people who are, you know, who might not have known him or too young or might not even have been born uh, by the time he died. So uh, it's it's a it's a continuous journey. It's a, it's a long journey. It's a journey which. Uh, takes you down uh, many different and many exciting paths, but uh, it is something that you keep moving forward, you keep remembering, and you keep trying to, to do new things, to do different things so that the memory remains fresh, it remains alive. It's, it's, like, an, it's like a person who is constantly changing, constantly evolving, and uh, constantly uh, growing. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about Navang. Uh, like all the officers, Navang started out in uh, in the military academy. Uh, for him, it was the officers training academy in Chennai. Uh, he graduated on second uh, of September two thousand. Uh, that was a day which was pretty much one of the most joyous and uh, the day full of pride. You can you can see in some of the photographs. Uh, my mother, my grandmother, and Navang himself uh, absolutely beaming. Uh, it was it was a culmination of a number of years of hard work by Navang to make it into the army. Uh, we we didn't come from a background of military or defense forces, so it was something relatively new for him and definitely for all of us. But uh, but you know as we saw him, uh, we were happy that he was starting a career which which he wanted, which he worked for, and uh, which he was excited about. Next slide, please. So uh, shortly after, uh, next slide, please. Uh, shortly after he joined uh, joined the army on the 70th day, so that was 11th November 2000. Uh, it was uh, next slide, please. It was also the it was also the day of uh, next slide, please. It was also the day of uh, Guru Purnima. Uh, it was uh, it was a public holiday. We received uh, we received the terrible news that. Uh, that Navang had been killed in, uh, in an anti-terrorist operation uh, in Kupwara in Kashmir. Uh, the details were sketchy, the phone lines were bad, but uh, within a few hours, we knew that the unfortunate news was confirmed. Uh, he, is, uh, he was cremated in Bombay uh, three days later uh, on uh, 14th of November. It was, um, it was, it was a start of uh, extremely grief-filled uh, two decades. Uh, you know, it, it, it really doesn't go away from you, but um, you know, it, time does help you to come to terms with it, to, to learn how to manage the grief, but uh, the, the essential grief still continues uh, with that. Uh, next slide, please. The, the web memorial really started out uh, in those times because we had, uh, we had family which was, uh, which was spread out. We had friends which were spread out. Uh, we didn't have any way of connecting with them, uh, and they didn't have any way of telling us about uh, the, the the tsunami of emotions which they felt. So uh, we set up uh, we set up something on the web, which uh, essentially shared some pictures, provided uh, provided a space where you could leave messages, and uh, we could talk within within a smaller group. But uh, you know, as as sort of time went by, uh, we we made a very conscious choice that you know uh, internet is a it's a medium which can reach a large number of people it is 
uh, it is within the uh, within the means and the resources of the family to be able to manage it and constantly uh, keep it updated. Uh, it is also something which which evolves over time, which can grow, which we can make it. Uh, we can take it in different directions as uh, as the environment uh, as around the goes. So uh, so you know what had started as um, as as a relatively small uh, uh, small effort, uh, we have. We have continued to make that into into a really central point of uh, of everything that we do uh, in the memory of Navang, or everything that uh, you know we feel. What uh, what do we when we want to express? How do we actually go about um, go about setting it up? Um, next slide, please. Now the the web memorial is uh, you know it's it's a online representation of. A number of physical memorials, uh, which the army maintains. So the army maintains around eight memorials where Nawang's name is inscribed. There are there are two civilian memorials uh, as well. Uh, for for soldiers and especially uh, for the army, uh, remembrances are they, they hold a very very special place. I mean, in every army establishment where we know there is uh, there is a memorial, that ground is considered sacred ground. Uh, it is always treated with uh, with the greatest of respects. Uh, we have been uh, we have attended a number of very very solemn and very respectful ceremonies uh, being held there. But the one incident that really sort of stands out to me is uh, during Navang's uh, passing out parade. Uh, right after the parade, all the cadets uh, were asked to change into their change away from their cadets uniform into the regimental uniform. Uh, and one of the first things they do after they move, change to their regimental uniform is go to the Hut of Remembrance at OTA, pay their respects before they come, um, come and meet their families. So it is, you know, it is, it is their way of remembering, their way of acknowledging that uh, people ahead of them have made the sacrifice for them to be inspired by the actions of these, uh, actions of these soldiers. Uh, that Heart of Remembrance at OTA now also has Navang's name uh, inscribed on it. Uh, it's a, it still continues to be a place which uh, cadets and the officers and the soldiers treated with the highest of uh, highest of respects. Next slide, please. So along with uh, along with the that's from the National uh, War Memorial. It's a it's a beautiful place. I'm I'm delighted to see. Um, uh, you know, see a national uh, memorial. I, um, it it always uh, it always sort of uh, brings me to tears on how large it is, and unfortunately, there are new names being added on that memorial uh, all the time. Uh, next slide, please. So, along with uh, uh, you know, along with the physical memorials, they have uh, as part of uh, remembrance, there have also been. Uh, Number of government uh, organizations, a number of non-government organizations who have, uh, you know, who have acknowledged the sacrifice. I think the the one that um, uh, the one that was the most, um, you know, the, mo the most well known of that is the badge of sacrifice, which is all, which is given by by the chief of defense, uh, by the chief of army staff. It's uh, it's a it's a it's a medallion which is accompanied by a certificate. But uh, also uh, the state government uh, through the collector of Bombay offers, uh, uh, presents a plaque, which is Tamba Patri. Tamba Patri in the Maharashtrian culture is a, it's a very special, it's a very, um, uh, it's a very sacred uh, certificate or a sacred memento, uh, memento to receive. Uh, Next slide, please. We have uh, we have also looked at um, and we have set up a number of trophies in uh, Navang's memory again uh, to keep things evolving to keep things current and uh, uh, current and changing. Uh, so there are there are three trophies which are which are actively annually awarded. Uh, the best adventurer uh, in the army that is through the army adventure wing out of Dehradun. Uh, at uh, in Varanasi at the 39 Gorkha Training Center, the best instructor from the course uh, is presented with the Lieutenant Navang Trophy, and uh, and at the core of uh, the core training school in Kashmir, where all soldiers have, have to undergo training before they enter uh, operations in valley, the best uh, best student is again awarded uh, uh, the Navang Trophy. So it's 
it's something which is annual it's uh, you know all the students uh, or all the cadets who go through that it's something that uh, they know it's a name that becomes familiar to them it it, it makes them more curious to uh, inquire about navang to make them more curious about uh, how did navang face those odds how did uh, how did he respond and if there are uh, there are lessons and inspirations which uh, which they can take back take back with them next slide please so um, you know navang was uh, a gorkha officer he was part of uh, the 4th battalion the 3rd gorkha rifles uh, gorkhas uh, carry a distinctive curved dagger called the kukri it's a sidearm which all gorkha soldiers and officers carry uh, so using that as a motif uh, we made a badge called the kukri of honor badge uh it's a badge which is just about 3 cm it's worn on the lapel or uh, on your blouses and uh, and we started offering these to uh, those who would be willing to wear it and uh, talk about navang talk about our soldiers uh, who are facing extreme hardship uh, to stand steadfastly against those who want to uh, do harm to india um so it's uh, it's something that we give out on the uh, on the web memorial we have I think over the past twenty years, we've uh, given out around twelve thousand of these uh, of these badges. Next slide, please. So, with um, along with the badge, uh, you know, I think I think the most uh, the the, tri the tributes which are most touching and uh, the most uh, the most heartfelt also co come from people who have a creative bent of mind, and uh, you know, people who are great visually. So, there are three logos. which have been created in navang's memory these are used in uh, multiple different ways all communication uh, that me and my family and our friends use we use one of these three logos there are a number of other ways in which uh, which we use logos as well um over the uh, next slide please uh, over the past few years i felt uh, that you know the the internet did not have enough of uh, graphic capacity for uh, indian army you know, indian army related graphics and uh, into a time which is much more visual where communication uh, is much more visual people like to absorb information much more visually i uh, we thought it's important to create uh, a visual uh, story of navang so that it's accessible to uh, more people so we created a graphic library we initially started with around 30 and uh, and it's been growing now uh, to around uh, it's reached around 50 or so but uh, we'll continue to add to that continue to make it into a much more uh, relevant place uh, one of the other things which we found is that a lot of the youngsters are much more attracted to to things which are visual uh, rather than articles or things which are written they the capacity to absorb information is much higher on the visual uh, medium than uh, uh, than reading or things of like that so so this becomes a great way of uh, connecting with them uh, connecting with them as well next slide please uh, over the years then uh, you know we who had a very unusual way of representing stories by creating graphics novels next slide please Uh, by creating graphic uh, graphic novels, so we created a graphic novel uh, for Navang, which um, eventually we converted into uh, into a movie as well. Uh, and uh, the graphic, um, you know, it's a it's a very nice way of uh, having uh, uh, young adults uh, be exposed to, I mean, young adults be exposed to people who have served uh, served in the defence force. Uh, however at our core if uh, you know everyone in the family loves mountains uh, my my parents both uh, are in mountains all the time uh, indian himalayas uh, hold a very special place uh, in their hearts and my heart and navang's heart navang himself had been to the mountains uh, himalayas a number of times he had been to siachen glacier in 96 where uh, where you know he saw young officers and was really inspired by their uh, Uh, by their zeal, by their josh, as they said. So uh, you know, it's it's fitting that uh, you know mountains are a part of uh, keeping Navang's memory alive. So my father, uh, ever since two thousand one, anything that my father does on the mountains is uh, uh, is in the memory of uh, of his son uh, Navang. So that could be 
you know, the numerous awards that he receives or the mountain that he's climbed on the top left corner, you can see uh, Navang's photograph uh, on the top of Mount Padmada, one of the last of the 7,000 meter uh, unclimbed feet, and that was the first ascent of Mount Padmada. My mother looks at mountains in a very different way. She likes to paint mountains uh, and all her paintings uh, of mountains are, uh, are in her memory. Uh, on the bottom right, you can see Navang and me on our first time in the Indian Himalayas. Uh, this was this the Sara Valley. Navang is uh, 11 years old. Next slide, please. Uh, and so uh, lastly, we also look at uh, planting trees given the, uh, you know, given the long-standing uh, nature of trees, also the the inspiring message of uh, growth, which uh, trees have been built into them. Uh, so this was something we started uh, literally the month that uh, Navang died. My parents were going to Nepal uh, uh, that month. So they planted a tree uh, uh, 20 years ago. That tree had, uh, in, the, in the shadows of the Himalayas and now grown strong, uh, it's grown vibrant. Uh, like we wish, uh, Navang would have uh, grown strong and vibrant. Uh, we also looked at an interesting thing about that every person has uh, has a tree sign, and Namang's tree sign is the Indian gooseberry or the amla tree. It's a it's a south extremely sour berry, very common in Maharashtra. Uh, we make uh, uh, we make juices out of it. We eat it with salt. Uh, it is something that Namang and I have eaten many a times in the Sayadris uh, when we've been uh, we've been in the mountains. Next slide, please. Uh, so with, with this, uh, with this, uh, I come to the end of um, you know the the response. Uh, and uh, before I go, I, I wanted to actually talk about my favorite. So amongst all the memorials, all the activity, the one that is closest to my heart uh, is the is the battalion's memorial uh, in the Almoda Cantonment, and uh, it is special because uh, because of the words inscribed in it, which talks about that the soul cannot be destroyed. Weapons cannot kill it, fire cannot burn it, water cannot dissolve it, and wind cannot dry it. It is immortal. I hope with all the work that we're doing on remembrance and memorialization, some part of Navang remains immortal and some part of Navang remains in everyone's memory long after all of us are not here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swanam. Thank you, the Padia family. Harish and Geeta. I just saw on your Facebook yesterday one of the most vibrant pictures of the young days. But uh, before we move on to our next panelist, let me read something what was uh, about uh, Navang from his sister, Namrata Meghpara. I'll just read the last few lines. Thou, there are million brothers, but none caring like you. Now we are a million miles apart, but you always remain in our heart. Thank you, Sonam. Now we travel all the way back in the time, almost 60 years to 1962. And in physical way, we travel all the way to Perth in Australia, where Cheryl and Foggy is waiting for us to share her experience. Cheryl is daughter of Captain John Albert Dalby, who fell honorably in Sela sector in 1962 in the China War. Dalby was a gunner from artillery and belonged to Five Field Regiment. Cheryl was only about five years old when he martyred. Captain John Dalby was born in Patna. He was educated in Bangalore at St. Joseph European High School. John was married to Gertitude June from Bombay. Actually, they met at Dalby's passing out parade as June's brother Richard was also getting commissioned. Cheryl was born in Jhansi, educated in Sacred Heart School and Jyoti Nivas College in Bangalore. She did her teacher's training in Darjeeling and worked as a teacher for a few years in Frank Anthony School in Bangalore. In 90. 85, she was married and migrated to Australia, did her master's in the Perth Western Australian University. She has two children, Samantha and Jonathan. 
He worked for the West Australian State Government for 15 years. Currently, she is with the Department of Justice in the Attorney General section in Perth, Western Australia. It is very cold out there these days. Cheryl will be speaking to us about her healing, closure, remembrance, and memorialization of Captain John Dalby, an experience, a miraculous journey to India, to the school of Dalby in Bangalore, to Babnu Jaisalmer, to meet her father's colleague, and to Arunachal Pradesh at the battle site in Jaswandgarh, 57 years after the water dome of Captain John Albert Talby. What we will do is first we will have a look at certain visuals which he has shared with us. She will uh, say something about it and then we'll ask her a few of her experiences. Uh, presentation, please. Anurag. Cheryl, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Oh, very warm welcome. Thank you. That's my handsome dad. Um, when he was at home, that's in his family um, garden, uh, a very large, larger than life man uh, with a booming voice, uh, which I have too. This is George and Susan, and they are the ones who actually started my journey of healing. It was George and Susan who went up to Tawang and took, this uh, took a photograph of the memorial. This is my visit to the regiment on raising day for the first time in my life. I could actually uh, lay a wreath and that wreath I took from Australia and had the colors of uh, dad's regiment. This photograph, tells you how heartbreaking it was because this is the first time I was confronted uh, by dad's death. This is in New Kudong. I visited that on my way up to Jaswantgar on the same day. This is the plaque. I just unveiled it. And this is in Jaswantgar in Tawang in Nifa sector. Uh, I had just uh, done, gone through the wreathing ceremony and I was extremely upset. Um, this is a very important picture because this is where behind um, this picture is a little glade. And if you all can just remember this glade because this is where I finally had my closure. Um, this vase I took up from Australia with those two Banksia flowers died in the colors of my father's um, regiment. And I took it as a representation of my sister and myself. And at the bottom, I took a little kangaroo and a little um, koala bear. So my dad would know that I had come all the way from Australia <laughs> to wish him farewell for the first time in my life. No, oh, that's very important. It is uh, a very yeah. important place, and this is where I got my final closure. Okay, next one. Yeah. This is my visit to Banmu village, where uh, you can see behind me in the picture is um, the three um, veterans who fought with my father in 1962. And when I first spoke to them, the, the veteran, Captain Vijay Singh, which is on on my left behind me in the red turban, he said to me, you've only lost one father. Don't cry, Beatty. You've gained four more. One, unfortunately, has since passed after my visit, but I keep in touch with them all, all the time and I wanted to honor them today. This is a, the, the memorial that was uh, finally uh, done when I went there to honor my father as well as three other Josephites and if you look at the bottom you can see their names and again the wreath that I carried I um, took it from Australia and uh, it was in the colors of my dad's school. As a little girl I played around that um, statue and this is the plaque that I um, 
I redesigned when I went up and unveiled. It is in Jaswantgarh. And this, uh, this is taken on the 19th of October last year, because at last I have a place where I can actually uh, remember my dad. I've never had a place. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. uh, so, so nice, uh, Cheryl. You are one of the strongest women I have ever met in my life. Uh, you know, you lost your father when you were about five years old, way back in 1962. All of you were happily living in Bengaluru. After an agonizing gap of almost 56 years, you achieved some sort of closure when you came to India, went all the way to Bengaluru, to Bamlu in Jaisalmer, to Jaswantgarh in Sela sector in Nepal, Arunachal Pradesh. It is one of the most poignant stories. But before we ask you to share your closure experience, which happened at that spot, tell us about your younger days, some nice days, and something about your father, and your growing up without the comforting hands of your father. So there are two aspects. And what made you come back to India after such a long time, Sharon? Before I start, I, I sh uh, before I begin to share my experience with you, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to you, General, your wife, Shalini, and Brigadier B. N. Singh for making this happen. But for your hard work and passion, today's event would not have eventuated. Also, I would like to thank my fellow panelists for participating. It is never easy. As I stumbled around in an emotional wilderness for 58 years, I met many travelers who traveled with me for part of this way and became significant others on this journey of mine. They were all compassionate, caring, loving, and supportive. Almost all never knew until 2019 that their friendship and love assisted me cope through those emotionally painful years. Many of you who know me are linked in right now listening to me. Unfortunately, others were not able to link in. I would like to acknowledge and thank you all for the crucial part you played in this, my journey of closure, 1962 to, 90, to 2019. In all of this one constant beacon, lighting my path in those desperate, lonely and emotional years, during good times and not so good times, was almighty God. When the going got tough, especially at the very lowest and saddest time, when I wasn't coping, the Almighty carried me. I am grateful and give thanks to God for being with me and guiding me all my life. I would like to first share with you all, there was never really any memorial for my father. My father disappeared, disappeared out of my life when I was five years old in 1962. And the whole family was in such shock that everybody just shut down emotionally. So he just disappeared, uh, never to be seen again at the age of 32. So in my family, nobody ever spoke of my dad. Nobody, um, all photographs were removed. We didn't know what he looked like. And I don't blame my family for this. It was just that it was so shocking that there was nothing. We never knew whatever happened to him. And growing up, I was really very angry and upset because he, my dad was never at my school functions. My dad was not at my graduation. He wasn't at my wedding. But some people would whisper very quietly that you had a lovely father. And, but for me, this father was never there. So it was extremely difficult for me for all of those years. I even had my children and I couldn't even tell them anything about the granddad because I didn't know myself. And then comes 2019 and I get this phone call on a Saturday where, where this lady says to me, hello, is that Cheryl Dolby? And I knew then that this was someone from my past. So it happened to be Rita Joseph. She is now Rita Abrahamson. She was my classmate. 
to school and she called me after 46 years. She then advised me that her brother had been up to Tawang on, on a holiday with his wife, Susan, and that he'd seen this plaque at Jaswant Gar with just my dad's name and Cheryl and Denise, that's my sister and myself and my mom's name, June. And so, so he, he seemed something triggered his memory and he took a photograph and he let Rita know that he had seen this plaque and Rita didn't know whether we knew about it. So we, all these years, these 58 years, we'd never had any kind of place that we could go to to remember my dad. I, it's a very long story, but the next thing I know is that George invited me to honor my father at his school. And when I said, yes, I would come because I had, I had just been an emotional wreck all those years, but I refused to speak to him, to speak about my dad because I did not want to hurt my mom or my sister. So I just carried on uh, with life. And, um, and when George said, would you come to honor uh, your father? I said, of course I would. And when I went, when I agreed to do that, George then contacted my father's regiment and they immediately said, no, please come for raising day and you can, you can lay a wreath at the memorial at the regiment. Um, I was the army and both serving and non-serving uh, and retired officers helped me to go all the way up the mountains to Jaswantgarh in Nifa. And I traveled up there uh, to unveil the plaque that I redesigned and which you saw. And, and the army there put on a wonderful honoring ceremony, a wreathing ceremony, and only the Indian army can do such a wonderful job. And so to, to really let you all know, I mean, there, there was no closure until that time. So visiting these memorials reinforced to me that in actual fact, my father had been remembered, but I just didn't know. So it helped me in many ways to have closure. So nice, uh, a very profound way of telling us. Cheryl, you have uh, some anger, has, or rather full anger had dissipated, some grief remains. But tell us about that uh, specific uh, movement uh, when in the valley of uh, uh, the river you experienced it? Yes, yes so, so after I had uh, done the wreathing ceremony in Jaswantgar, I had been told that my father had, had, had actually lost his life at a place called Jang, which is a little iron bridge. And a major, Amitesh Ranjan, and two Subhada majors took me to Jang Bridge. And when we got out of the car, as soon as I got out, I knew I had arrived. I just felt that there was something there. Until that time, I never didn't know whether my father had died, whether he was still wandering around in the mountains because he'd never been seen again in, since 1962 on the 18th of November. But when I crossed that bridge, I knew that, yes, this is the place. So when I crossed the bridge, I was told that my father I, and I asked you all to try and remember, there was a glade behind that photograph. And I was told that my father had been ambushed at that glade. So I had taken that vase and uh, to represent my sister and myself. And because I was from Australia, I thought, okay, I'll leave something behind for dad uh, to show him that I come all the way from Australia because it was my belief that if he had died, he had been resurrected and he had eternal life. And while they were doing this, and the, the, those two uh, Subhadars were sticking the, 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 the vase and organizing it for me, it started to grow very dark and gloomy. And Major Ranjan told me, we better go back because I think it's going to rain and we're going to get stuck here. So I said, yes. And so I said, could you please stand with me and let us say a prayer for my father silently and then we leave. So the four of us uh, 
so the four of us, we were standing over there and we were facing the glade with our heads bowed and it became very, very dark. And it was almost like the gods were as sad as I was. And then we heard, it was just got really dark. And then we heard this rumble and we all looked up at the mountain because we thought that we were going to be stuck in a landslide because there was this huge mountain, uh, mountain behind. And when we raised our faces upwards towards the sky to look at what, where, what was this rumbling, it was like we were blessed. There was just a sprinkling of water on all four of us. And then in the most spectacular manner, this glade, this, this glade lit up in a golden, in golden sunlight. And I felt this warm feeling. And I, I, and I, it was almost like someone was hugging me. And I thought, oh Lord, at last, you know, I've been so grief stricken in these last few days that, you know, I've lost the plot. And suddenly Major Ranjan started shouting and saying, ma'am, I think your father is here. I can feel your father here. And both the Subhadar Majors said, yes. And then I realized that my father had come one last time to, one last time to um, greet his daughter and reassure me that I was, that he was there and he'd been with me all my life. I just didn't know that. And to, that was my moment of closure. I knew he was with my mom and that he, were, he was, he had lost his life in the most beautiful area and that he was at rest. And that was my moment of closure. And from that time onwards, I have been able to accept that he didn't actually disappear. He gave his life for our country, for me, for our safety. And I'm a very proud daughter today with no anger or anything like that. So that was the experience that I had with closure. And that place, that Jung Bridge, will always be my place uh, as a sense that is where my memory will always uh, be that that is the memorial where my father laid down his life. Karen, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just want to end it uh, by saying that, as you can see, memorialization is whatever, in whatever form always brings closure. However, the pain of losing someone so significant in our lives never ever goes away. We just learn through the years to cope better. So to conclude, at the rising and setting of the sun, all over the world, wherever we are, let us remember the ultimate sacrifice these courageous and brave warriors made for their country and all of us. They gave up their today for our tomorrow, lest we forget. That's uh, very courageous of you to come and talk to us. It's not easy and uh, we can see it, but uh, we are honored. And uh, before we move to our next panelist, Cheryl's message is to everybody that whatever may be happening, we should always work for peace. And that is a very uh, fine saying from you, Cheryl. Now, having listened to the three very emotional uh, uh, talks and experiences, let us go to a special man who has uh, done amazing amount of work for all the 26,300 uh, fallen of India. I welcome Wing Commander Mushtaq Ahmed Afraz normally known as Afraz. He has served in the Indian Air Force for 25 years before embarking on a mission to inspire the country through his social initiative called Honor Point. He comes from a military family where his father, wife, brother-in-law to served in the armed forces. Basically, he was an electronics engineer.
Wing Commander Afras, sir, there seems to be a technical glitch on General Heyman's audio. May I request you to please take on till he rejoins us? Okay, sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, General Heyman, uh, for that uh, rather flattering uh, introduction. And uh, thank you for having me uh, a part of uh, this uh, esteemed panel. To tell you about the story of On a Point, as uh, he mentioned, I come from a military family. I was born in a military hospital, grown up in various military cantonments, and then joined the Air Force of there for 25 years. My, fa my father, my wife, too, served in the Air Force. She's also a former wing commander. So growing up in this military environment, one thought always bothered me as to what happens to these soldiers who give away their lives for the country? What happens to their families? Where do they go? Where are the stories of these fallen heroes who gave away everything for our nation? And this thought uh, always was playing on the mind uh, during my growing up years in various military cantonments and you know, at my Air Force stations, I visited various uh, memorials. And always noticed whenever you visit any memorial, you get to see only the name, the service number, the regiment of unit and the year of martyrdom, that's all. The stories are lost forever. And I always believed that it is the story it's not the name, but the deeds which make the person important and which can be inspiring. So I always thought how to bring these stories into public domain. And this particular thought got concretized during the Kargil War uh, when I was in the Air Force during that period. And always uh, I saw the war being covered by various TV channels and, and the martyrs being covered. and immediately being forgotten after three or four days, nobody even remembered the names. So I thought that something had to be done to bring these stories into public domain. So after hanging my boots, I decided to give shape to my dream and that's how On A Point came into being nearly six years back and we started working on this concept of On A Point. And after nearly working for nearly two years, you know, after uh, hiring employees uh, and renting the place uh, for the office. We worked for nearly two years and actually launched the website, this portal called Honor Point, www.honorpoint.in in the year 2017, nearly four and a half years back. So we are actually working for, with Honor Point with three clear objectives. The first, as, as I said, to bring the story of every fallen soldier into public domain and inspire the people of the country to do something for the country in their own way, in whichever field they're working. The idea is not to inspire the people to join the armed forces, no. A nation needs all professionals, but what a nation needs, citizens who think about the nation, and that's the whole idea. And second, our objective, because creating that repository of information is one, one task, but how do people come to know about them? How do people know uh, who their real heroes are? So that itself is a challenge because in today's world where there's a deluge of information, information is flowing from all directions, there are so many commitments, there are so many distractions, so many targets to be achieved, so much to do. How to get the attention of the people and and take these stories to the people. So that itself is a challenge. And we have to connect with the whole country, you know, irrespective of their age, their education background, social status. We have to connect with every Indian wherever they are. So we use every possible medium of communication to connect with people. We are on social media, we are on Facebook, Instagram, etc. We have more than half a million followers on Facebook few thousands on Instagram, but then everybody is not on social media. So we try to connect with people using various offline platforms too, like addressing various schools, colleges, corporates. We also take part in various outdoor events like marathons, music shows, etc. We're also collaborating with the TV channel, radio channels. In fact, we are collaborating with the TV9 group where our uh, program is uh, being telecast in five languages every Sunday in Hindi, Gujarati, Marathi, Telugu, and Kannada. 
by the name Mash Shaheed Hoon. That's the name of the program. Right now, the telecast is stopped because of COVID. The shooting is not happening. But as soon as the, the things normalize, the, the telecast will start again. So that is our second area of activity. And third area of activity is actually working for the benefit of these martyrs' families. So when we say we are working for the benefit, we are not here to do some kind of fundraising for the families. That's not how we look at the whole issue. Because here, there is the government of India and the second constituent is the people of the country. Government of India has certain responsibility towards these families. They're supposed to take care of the pension, their financial benefits, etc. And we believe that government is doing its duty very well. But what, as citizens of this country, what are we doing for them? They gave away their lives, not for the government alone, but for all of us. Then, what are we doing for them? So we are into the business of creating that awareness about that moral obligation among the people of the country. So when we do these programs, we mean we try to con connect the civil society with these families and let them know what they are going through, what they have gone through, and what do they expect from the people of the country. And let them understand and let them know them and then decide what they want to do for them. So that is our approach uh, in connecting these families with the, uh, with the people of the country. So these are our three, three clear objectives we are working with. And another point I would like to uh, emphasize here is that we have a deliberate approach that not to look at the government for any kind of support. As I said, we believe that government is doing its duty. So we want every support for this initiative to come from the people of the country, whether it is financial support or non-financial support. We want people to support this initiative. We want people to get involved in this cause because then only we will meet our objective. So that is what is the, in short, about on a point. And there have been many, many challenges uh, in creating this uh, humongous uh, repository of information. As you know, uh, to get support for any entrepreneur is, is, is very difficult uh, in the beginning. And if the initiative happens to be a social initiative when there is no financial gain for anyone, uh, the support is very, very difficult to come by. So I also faced a lot of challenges. I'm still facing a lot of challenges, but I have that belief that support will come uh, from the people of the country and I'm going uh, strong with every passing day. So the challenges were uh, the first, uh, of course, the manpower challenge, the financial uh, support challenge, which uh, every social entrepreneur faces. This whole initiative has been conceptualized as something like Wikipedia of martyrs. Anybody who wants to know about any fallen soldier about the country, this is the place to go. And that's how it has been conceptualized. And the whole vision is very, very large. It has got a national objective. Because, yeah. Yeah, please, please. Yeah, you, you want to come? No, no, you carry on, uh, then I'll ask you the next question. Okay, sure. Yeah, so I was talking about uh, challenges. Uh, so uh, it has been visualized, as I said, as a Wikipedia of uh, the fallen soldiers. And we want to, uh, right now, it is being developed in only in English, and it has thousands and thousands of pages, and we have taken many years to reach uh, some stage, uh, but there's a long way to go. So it's a humongous task. So we need a lot of people. We need uh, manpower uh, resources, and we need financial resources. So that's a challenge. That challenge is uh, still there. Though uh, now over a period of time, a lot of credibility uh, has come. You know, uh, the honor point story has been covered by various print media, TV, and radio channels. So a lot of credibility has come. So we are getting uh, some support from individuals and some organizations, but it is, it is, it is still uh, 
uh, very, very, very less. Uh, we need uh, much more than that because we need people uh, to collect this information, uh, to authenticate, to go through, uh, to do the proofreading, and we want to develop the content in all regional languages. So right now it is being developed in English. We want to you know, translate the whole content into Hindi, in Gujarati, Marathi, in all other regional languages. So that's a big challenge. We are also taking the help of various corporates who are developing software for us uh, to translate. But as of now, uh, we have not succeeded because uh, Google translation or any kind of translation which uh, presently is available doesn't work because the language uh, has to be, it is very sensitive subject. You know, you can't play with the words. You know, uh, it can, it can uh, create havoc uh, with the meaning. So we can't depend on automatic translation. So right now we'll have to translate physically uh, into other languages. So for that we require, uh, you know, we have staff, well-qualified staff, and, and which which are not easy to come by and who are not uh, cheap. So that is that is the challenge which always remains. The other challenge, uh, which is very very uh, a very typical challenge which we face, is a collection of the information. Because we have, as I said, more than 26,000 soldiers and we have the basic data of every soldier who has died for the country. We have the basic data, you know, name, number, service number, uh, the unit and uh, regiment and, and the year. But we are into the business of collecting detailed information about every soldier. So that's a very, very challenging task, especially for the soldiers of, you know, of 1947 era and, uh, uh, and after that. And in that, there are many challenges. First, uh, especially the old, uh, olden lot, uh, when there was no internet, there is no information available on the net. And as some of you would know, that war is a very, very complex operation. In Commander Afraz, yeah. uh, 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 I don't know how to disturb you, but we are uh, uh, running towards the timeline. Okay. So, with your permission, I will ask you a question. Yeah, that's that's better because uh, a, you know a founder is very very passionate, and I can keep going on and on. So please check my time. Thank you. Uh, you know, your uh, memorial is interactive. Yeah. Uh, next of kin come and share their things. Yeah, sure. Their stories. They thank you. They thank everybody. They pay virtual homage. Many of the citizens come. So that is actually the real uh, strength of the memorial. You're given an identity. Just share uh, one uh, out of 26,300, uh, one incident. Yeah, I think to pick one incident is very, very difficult and unfair, but uh, still due to possible time, I'll just cover probably one uh, incident. Uh, that was uh, long back when we had just uh, started off. Uh, we got an email from a lady and uh, who uh, wrote to us. And this was regarding flying officer Bunsha, uh, who, was, uh, who was martyred during the 1965 war. So we are talking about more than 55 years back. And she wrote to us that, uh, thank you on a point for bringing my Farooq alive once again, because his name was Farooq Bunsha. And this lady was engaged uh, to that pilot. And uh, uh, she said that he was, uh, he loved uh, flying, he loved the country, he loved everything, and he loved me too. And uh, he was the noblest person and you can't find a person like him in today's world. And I have lived my life uh, through his words. And uh, uh, she said, uh, thank you from bottom of my heart uh, for honoring the honorable. This, uh, imagine a lady of the age of 70 plus uh, writing to us after 55 years. And uh, of course, she didn't mention whether she was married or not, probably not. And she has lived uh, by, by his words. Uh, so that was so heart touching, you know, that, uh, that I cried that day uh, reading the mail. And uh, I thought that uh, this is it. And uh, I have achieved what I wanted to. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, reading that mail, uh, 
you know, another relative of that uh, flying officer, you know, uh, got in touch and he wrote to us and they, uh, they got connected uh, with the fiance and uh, probably, uh, you know, they had a meeting and all that, you know, which we don't know after that. But this was one incident uh, which was really heart touching. Uh, there are many more uh, stories like that, uh, which has touched the lives of the martyrs' families and also the lives of various citizens who have got uh, inspired uh, by these stories. Thank you, uh, Wing Commander Afraz. You have brought uh, uh, much uh, uh, relief to 26,300 uh, next of kin of the soldiers. You know, when you touch base and you see that you are being heard somewhere, somebody is paying homage, and you have somebody taking care, it means a lot. I think you have done one of the greatest works and uh, uh, I'm not going uh, into your uh, uh, your achievements and awards, which you got plenty of them. Uh, we wish you all the very best for continuing with your effort. Uh, with that, we will be heading uh, towards closing today's session. Uh, Preeti, Sonam, Kapadia family, Cheryl, Wing Commander Afraz, it has been a uh, very, very touching movement over the last uh, 75 minutes. Uh, we go back enriched, we are humbled, and uh, we know now what it means to get a closure, what it means to remember in a slightly more deeper way. I'll uh, now request uh, Brigadier Basad Narayan Singh to kindly say his uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you, General HK, sir. And thanks, our esteemed panelists. What a session. It kept us afloat in all the waves of emotion, realization, and touched our hearts. Above all, reasserted our consciousness that we owe so much to our fallen heroes and let them not fade in our memory and their families. Our collective gratitude from MLCF to each one of you, ladies and gentlemen, for what you are doing. It's all Swanta Sukhai. You are an example to the society. Our best wishes to each one of you, to Mrs. Preeti Gill, Sonam Kapadia. He said that the last man of the society keeps the memory alive. The fallen heroes are amongst us. Cheryl, you too would live in our memory because the way you tried to relive those days of father and your emotional sakshatkar with him. Great. A round of applause to you. Wing Commander of Ross, sir, hats off to you for your dogged determination to face the challenges. We all from MLCF wish you all the best and it will be a pleasure to see if we can be of in any way associate with you for something. G ladies and gentlemen, we are celebrating Golden Jubilee of 1971 war. And by choosing this topic, it couldn't have been more apt. Through this session, we all pay our homage to our fallen heroes. Thanks, General HK, sir. May you soon come out with your film project, Redeeming the Lost Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, here I come to a close. Today's session was the last one of part one of MLCF in the year 2021. Our part two will commence from first week of October and we'll keep you posted. Thank you all once again. Grateful. Thank you, everyone.
we close the meeting sir thank you we can uh, close the meeting now and